tonight, I want you to open your Bible to Romans chapter 5. This week in your Romans journal, starting tomorrow, you're going to be reading Romans 5. And so I thought I'd give you a, a bit of a taste, some cliff notes, a little bit of an outline to help you in your reading this week. And I want to preach a message to you uh, that I've titled, Eden to Gethsemane. Eden to Gethsemane. Recapping a bit of Romans chapter 5. I don't know if there's anyone out there that's like me, but at different points in my life, uh, I've struggled with guilt. Is anyone honest enough in here to say, yo, I've, I've dealt with guilt a little bit, okay? If your hand's not up, it's because you're lying. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but it's fascinating to me, and maybe one of the most heartbreaking things for me as a pastor is I get to counsel and talk with people, and I'll talk with people that are followers of Jesus, and although they follow Jesus, somehow they're still struggling with this weight of guilt and shame. And sometimes it's hard for us to believe that God has forgiven us. And other times it's just hard for us to forgive ourselves. Yet if you're going to follow Jesus, you must understand that guilt has to go. God did not save you in order to condemn you. Ever since I can remember, I've never really done good with guilt. In fact, even as an adult man, I'm pretty lousy when it comes to guilt. I'm one of these kind of people that if I've done something wrong, I have a hard time living with myself. I just, I, I just confess stuff. I'm not good at hiding secrets. I hate the feeling of guilt. I just want to just get it out, you know? I'm the kind of guy, if I see a police officer, even though I didn't commit a crime, I just go like, yo, I did some stuff when I was 12, you know? <laughs> one time this police officer, this is a true story, pulled me over. I was going about 20 miles an hour over the speed limit. And I'm not good at excuses with cops. I just kind of, you know, I just admit stuff. And so this guy, he pulled me over. You ever been pulled over and like, you knew you were caught red-handed? I already had my license and my registration out. I'm like, just take it, just take it. And he goes, you were going pretty fast. I said, yes, sir. He said, did you know you're speeding? I said, I said yes, sir. Uh, why were you going so fast? Because I wanted to get there fast. <laughs> why did you want to get there so quickly? Because I deal with impatience. <laughs> You must have been going pretty, somewhere pretty important. Sort of. Where were you headed? To the movies. <laughs> were you late to the movies? No, I just really liked the previews a lot. <laughs> Ever since I could remember as a little kid, I just, I've got this like confession thing. I just, I just speak it out. And I, I think a lot of it probably has to do with the fact that I was raised by a good dad. You know, when you have a good earthly father, it so helps you view your heavenly father in a better perspective. And my earthly dad, what I learned is I can go back to different times as a little boy where I had done something wrong and I had guilt in my heart. And I, I can tell you time after time where I'd wake up in the middle of the night, I don't know what it is, and I would go to his door of his bedroom. I'd knock on the door. I was crying. <laughs> you ever cry so hard you, you, were, you were certain you had asthma? You know, like that was my kind of crying. <laughs> I would say, Dad. And I would confess. But I learned something very valuable at a young age that every time I confessed to my dad, I always felt better and he always forgave me. I wish some of you could catch this principle tonight because it works the exact same way with your heavenly father. That whenever we're dealing with guilt, if we will confess it, you're going to feel better. But even better than feeling better, he's going to forgive you. The challenge is, is God can't heal what you continue to hide. Guilt is this thing that comes from crossing the boundaries, uh, crossing the line, um, um, breaking commitment, committing an offense. Yet when it comes to our spiritual guilt, what the scriptures will reveal to you and I is that our spiritual guilt has less to do with what we have done and more to do with who we are. See, we were born guilty. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but all of us have this tendency to want to hide. We have this knee-jerk reaction. I don't, I don't want to show you all of my cards, and I definitely don't want to deal with all of my stuff. And so we, we go into hiding. Have you ever wondered why it is that you love to go into hiding? Well, Paul in Romans chapter 5 is going to give us some indication as to why we go into hiding. And ultimately, the way that he's going to do that is by going all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, and he's going to reference the Garden of Eden and the very first human beings on the planet, Adam and Eve. Now, if you come to church here, you probably heard me talk about Adam and Eve a lot and the Garden a lot. You say, Rich, why do you bring them up so many times in your sermons? The reason why I do so is because what Adam and Eve started is what Jesus finished. 
And you will never appreciate all of his work until you understand just how badly they messed it up. And so many of our problems and so many of our issues, they go all the way back to our bloodline. They go all the way back to our ancestry. They go all the way back to our DNA and our lineage. The reason why you hide is because your great, 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 grandpa and grandma hid. Their name was Adam and Eve. And so just to, before you get into Romans 5, you, you got to see this because he's going to make a powerful analogy at the end of Romans chapter 5 that has to do with this. And really, let me just recap it. If you've never been to church before or it's your first time in this type of a setting, Eden was this garden that God created. It was a paradise. It was utopia. It was perfect. And it was a free gift given to Adam and Eve. Adam being the first man that was created and Eve, the first woman created. I love the story of their creation for Adam God came and took dirt from the ground, breathed into dirt, and he created a man. That's a wild thought. That oxygen is important, but I'm telling you, the real thing that's sustaining you is the breath of God. And if God can breathe into dirt, what would happen if you would showcase, if you would just say, hey, God, I got some dirt in my life, but I got a feeling even if I give you my dirt, you could breathe on it and you could make something beautiful out of my dirt. Come on, somebody. If you got some dirt in your life and you love God to redeem it, give him praise tonight. See, see God will use everything in your life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. God, God will take all of those skills that you think are not much, all of that gifting, all of that talent, those limited resources, and if you'll offer it over to him, he will breathe on it, and he will use it for his glory. And the scripture says that, that God, he creates Adam. And Adam is the king over creation. Adam has dominion over the garden. Quickly, God gives him a task. The task is to name all the animals. As he's naming these animals, God looks down upon man and says, it is not good for man to be alone. And all the men said, amen. <laughs> Can you imagine if God would have just left us down here alone? A bunch of dudes and animals. <laughs> we wouldn't even have a language. We'd be barking, arr, arr, arr. What did he say? He said, how are you doing today? So God looked down upon man and said, it's not good for man to be alone. I want to make a helper. Everyone say helper. helper. And so he put man to sleep and from his rib, he created a helper. Her name was Eve. Ladies, I said helper. <laughs> not harasser. There's some guys that this is the first time they've ever clapped in church. <laughs> Fellas, I said helper, not assistant. Oh, where's all the godly women of God that are going to back up their pastor and say, yeah, yeah. The, the point I'm trying to always make as we see this picture is that male and female were not to compete, but rather they had one mission and they were to help one another in partnership. Co-laborers. Pretty much in this perfect utopia, this free gift that God had given mankind, he had one divine rule. Not a law, not a list of rules, not Leviticus, don't eat crawfish, don't get tattooed. None of that was there. Rather, there was two trees in the Garden of Eden. One was known as the tree of life, and the second tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One day, the scripture says, that Adam and Eve, as they were walking in the garden, they were naked and they felt no shame. Important that you see this picture because this is our original state. Not that we would live in hiding full of guilt and condemnation, but rather we would be fully vulnerable, fully transparent, naked and no shame. And one day Eve is walking through the garden and a serpent starts to speak to her. Now maybe you're here tonight and you're going, this is why I don't come to church. Because you guys believe in like Disney World, man. I don't know, what is this, like something from Aladdin? What do you mean a serpent was speaking? Well, it shouldn't surprise you that the serpent was speaking because every girl in this room knows that you always get into trouble the moment you start talking to snakes. Somebody's like, you're right, Pastor. 
<laughs> yeah. How do you know you're talking to a snake? Well, the snake says to Eve, did God really say, Eve, not to eat from this tree? See, what snakes will do in your life is snakes single, single desire is to get you to question God. I didn't say sin against God, just question God. But this is the starting point of all sin. He'll take it further. He'll say, did God really say not to eat from this tree? Don't you know that if you eat from this tree, God knows that you'll be like him. So really what the serpent does is he tempts Eve and he shows Eve that I have a better plan for you than God does. And Eve, why don't you take matters into your own hands? Why don't you become the God of your own life? And Eve, are you really content with this paradise? Are you really content with this utopia? Don't you know there's so much more and everything about God's rules and parameters is to punish you and limit you and stop you? And all Eve has to do is give listening ear to the voice of the snake and she begins to doubt the promise of God. Sin is not a behavior thing. Sin is a believing thing. Every time I sin, it's not an indication that I am immoral and evil. That's just half of it. The deeper thing is I don't believe God at his word. I don't believe God at his word. I got to take matters into my own hands. I need to eat that fruit so I can be like God. God's trying to limit me. And that's how some of you still, you still view all of the plans of God as a limiting factor that's trying to hold you back when really these things are for your promise and for your future. So, so, and so Eve, she, she eats the fruit. The Bible says that Adam, he, he shows up on the scene and, and well, if girls, all of your problems are because you listen to snakes, well, all of guys' problems are because we make decisions on what we see and feel rather than based upon what we heard from God. Dude was in the garden and named every animal and never touched that fruit. All it took was one naked woman going, you want some of this fruit? <laughs> he was like, ah. <laughs> this, is, this is men, right? This is men. Trading everything for nothing. And he, and he eats the fruit. And the moment they eat the fruit, I want you to see this. The moment they eat the fruit, sin enters into the equation. And the first reaction to their sin is they notice that they are naked. You're naked, I'm naked. And they go, we got we to cover up. Then they hear that God's coming. And so they run from God and they hide in the bushes. See, when they ate the fruit, this is what we call original sin. It was the original sin, but it also created the doctrine of original sin. They ate the fruit, God comes and finds them, and because they sinned, because they disobeyed, God kicks them out of the garden. They are banished from the garden, no longer having access to the tree of life, and now the result of their sin is that they will die. Yet the result of their sin did not just have consequences for them. The original sin, which is them eating the fruit, but also the doctrine of the original sin, is now that anyone that comes after Adam, that's you and I, we are now born into Adam's sin. And what it means is, is that the ramifications of Adam's sin don't just have consequences for him, but they also have consequences for me. And the reason why I live with guilt and shame is because the moment I was born into this world, long before I committed a sin, I was already a sinner. For I am a son of Adam. Some of you are like, this is why I don't like Adam. He messed my whole life up. Before you go judging Adam, please understand if the opportunity had been afforded to you, you probably would have failed also. So what does God do? God quickly reinstates a new system, a new plan. After Eden, a new plan had to be instated. And so he came up with this system. The system is known as the law. The law began with 10 commandments and then it grew and grew and grew. Why? Because the law always exposes sin. And it always says you could do more and you could do more because the law's aim and the law's effort is to try to get you to be like God, to be perfect, but you're not perfect. And in the law, there was a temporary solution to eradicate your sins. I say temporary because the way that your sins could be covered was that you had to slaughter a, a lamb or a goat and then their blood, 
They would pay the price for your sin. They would die. Their blood would cover your sin, but only momentarily. Why? Because you would sin again. Because you would sin again, you'd have to find another lamb, another goat. It was a vicious cycle. The law could not save us and the law could not heal us. In fact, the law's greatest contribution is that it creates a revelation for the need of a savior. From Eden onward, the law was instituted. It's going, man, we need someone to save us from this. This is why God sent Jesus. For Jesus was not any ordinary lamb, but rather he was the lamb of God who doesn't just cover sins, but he cancels sins and he takes away sins. He went to a cross to pay the price for your sins. Come on, somebody, if you believe it tonight. Give him a shout in this house at 6 p.m. See, I want you to see this because now we're getting into Romans 5. For you finished your reading Romans 4 on Friday. Did you notice the last word in Romans 4? If you don't, that's okay. Look in your Bible. Last word of Romans 4 is justification. And now all of Romans 5, Paul is trying to illustrate to you that you have been justified through Jesus Christ. Justification. Well, what does this word justification mean? We need to get this as we read Romans 5. Justification means being put into right standing with God through Jesus. So when Jesus died, his death satisfied God for the payment of sin. And now when I put my trust and my faith in Jesus, it puts me into right standing with God. Rich, how could I be in right standing with God based upon Jesus' sacrifice? I wasn't sacrificed. Jesus was sacrificed. Well, that's the next word, and it's an important word. The next word is, is that Jesus Christ, he imputed all of his righteousness into you. Now, this word imputed is important because this is a theological word that you need to get into your spirit. And you're going to see it all throughout Romans. Imputed means this, to take something that belongs to someone and credit to another's account. So when Jesus died, it pleased God. It satisfied the wrath of God, the judgment of God. And now when I put my trust in his sacrifice, I am justified, meaning I'm put back into right standing with God because Jesus has imputed his righteousness unto me, meaning he's credited my account. He's taken his righteousness and put it upon me. Therefore, when God sees me, he doesn't see me and he doesn't see my problems and he doesn't see my sin, but rather he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Oh, I think Jesus deserves a five-second prayer break because he gave you that which you could never buy. Come on. It's just gospel preaching. We haven't even opened the text yet. This is important because as Paul writes Romans 5, he's a You understand the premise of original sin. He's assuming that you understand that Adam got you into this mess and your guilt that you're dealing with. Well, that guilt, guess what? That was on you the day you came into the world. In order to get rid of that guilt, you must understand that you've been justified through Jesus' sacrifice. I want to show you in the first portion of this text, I want to show you Romans 5, 1 through 11. You're going to start reading this tomorrow. I want to show you just five blessings that we receive as believers in simply knowing that we're justified. So watch this. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, I won't say therefore. therefore. Therefore means in conclusion. So what's the inclusion do? In conclusion to justification. So I'm talking about justification. Therefore, here we go. Since we have been. We're going to, we're going to, it's like Sunday school. Since we have been. Justified. There you go. Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ first thing that you need to understand is that we have peace. We have peace. Because I'm justified, I now have peace. I'm no longer an enemy of God. I'm no longer at odds with God. I have right standing with God. Now I have peace. When I was a little boy, my papa, my grandfather, he would always give a salvation call at the end of his sermons, just like we do here at Vu Church. In fact, tonight, we'll give people an opportunity to put their trust in Jesus I think it's just good housekeeping, but that's never a time for us to get up and leave. That's never a time for us to get on the phone. That's always a sacred moment that for so many, it's a moment they will never forget. In fact, that moment is what makes an ordinary Sunday an extraordinary Sunday. 
And my papa, though, he would always, this is how he'd always do his salvation calls. He would always at the end go, if you're here today and you want to make your peace with God, I'll never forget that as a little boy. And I used to wonder, where does, what does he mean by that, my peace with God? Well, he was quoting Romans 5. The way you make your peace with God is through Jesus. If you feel like you're at odds with God, get into relationship with Jesus and you will find peace. A peace that passes all understanding. I don't know if you've noticed this, but we live in a world right now that has pain that doesn't make any sense. And the only antidote for pain that doesn't make sense is a peace that doesn't make sense. A peace that transcends my thinking. See, because I'm not at odds with God, God is no longer my judge. Now God is my father. And because I know that I'm justified, we have peace. Romans 5 verse 2, watch this, we're going to keep walking through the text. Through whom we have gained access by faith. By, faith. by going to Vu Church every Sunday night. <laughs> by going to all four steps of the growth track. By serving every week at Vu Church. Doesn't say any of that. Through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Because I'm justified, we have access to God. You need to get this in your spirit. Maturity in Jesus is knowing that at any moment of the day, you have access to God. Newsflash, you don't need me to get to God. You don't need a pastor. You don't need a priest to connect with God. You have access all on your own because of the sacrifice and the blood of Jesus. <laughs> See, it's good news because I don't know what's going to happen on your Monday. And I don't know what's going to happen on Wednesday. But I know this, no matter the storm, come hell or high water, at any moment you can stop right there in the midst of your pain and you can access heaven's throne room and you can know that you know that you know your God hears you, not because you've done enough good stuff, but because he loves you and you're justified. Come on, somebody give him praise. Come on, 6 p.m. I want our church to know this. Pastors fail you, man. Leaders fail you. I'm not against pastors and leaders. I am one. <laughs> but I want you to know that you have access to God. Not because you did enough good things. Well, you know, I've been reading my Bible a lot, so I feel like God's really listening to me. No, no, no. It's not that God's really listening to you. Because you're reading your Bible a lot, now you hear God a lot louder. It's just called conversation. This is the first time you heard him. You have access to God because you've been justified. Because I'm in right standing with God. Because his righteousness has been imputed unto me. I now have access to heaven's throne. This is not even my sermon. I'm, I'm, I've stole this from Paul. Here we go. <laughs> Romans 5, 2b. And, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Number three, we have hope. We have hope. Because I'm justified, I now have hope. There's this beautiful scripture in Thessalonians, and it says that we don't grieve like the world grieves. It doesn't mean that we don't grieve. It just means we don't, we, don't, we don't grieve like the world because the world is hopeless, but we have hope. I was... In, in, in the middle of the, of the service break, I went and visited my, my, my uncle Greg, who has been so close to me since I was a little boy, um, was diagnosed with lung cancer in December and it's spread now to his brain. And it's a very bad report that they have given him. Today in the break, I went and I, and I talked with him and my uncle Greg is an incredibly articulate communicator. I mean, his words, it's like, I want to like, I want to like record his words. And I wish he was the ghostwriter for every book I ever wrote. He's just incredibly talented and gifted. And there we are, <laughs> in the hospital this afternoon and his whole entire left side is paralyzed. Yet in the midst of all of his pain, in the midst of all of his trouble, he glorifies God. He praises God. He testifies of the grace of God. You say, where does that come from? That comes from a hope that is an anchor for your soul. It's not optimism. It's not mind over matter. It's not happily ever after. It's that I know I am destined for an eternal hope. I have a home and it's called heaven. And although I might leave this world and I might be sad temporarily, I have an eternal hope. Come on, does anybody out there 
know what I'm talking about tonight. I, I have hope because I'm justified. I, I, I know that I've got hope. And Paul continues and he says in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 4, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. What? This is the kind of stuff, if you're not careful, you'll read this week and you'll just be like, that's cute. Glory in my sufferings. Have you ever done that? James echoes it. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kind. The message version says, consider it pure joy every time you face unnecessary pain. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's a gift. No, no. What'd you get me? You got fired. What? It's not a gift. <laughs> Paul, because I'm justified and because you're justified, you don't have to live in guilt. You don't have to live in shame. You don't have to live in hiding. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. <laughs> this is... See, because I'm justified, we now have daily confidence. Da daily confidence. If you don't learn this, this is what's going to happen to you. If you don't learn this, every time something bad happens to you, you will think that God is trying to punish you. And the problem is, is that a lot of you are mistaking God's preparation as punishment. But, but, but if you knew the whole story, you'd be like, wait a minute. Pfft. Sin entered the equation and we're all dying and everything's broken and everything's jacked up and there's a ripple effect to all of that. But I know because of Jesus that I'm justified that his righteousness, not based upon my effort or deeds, has been imputed unto me. Therefore, I'm in right standing with God. And so now that I'm facing suffering, I don't have to wonder or question if God is out to get me. I now know with a firm confidence every single day that every bit of suffering is really a setup for me to get stronger and stronger and stronger. Oh, I feel like preaching to somebody tonight in this room. My, my, my dad, once again, my dad taught me this principle. My dad is the guy who, like, no matter what, like, you can't take away his joy. You could throw, you could falsely accuse this guy, put him in prison. He'd be like, this is great. <laughs> like, no, it's not. No, son, this is great. God's going to use it for his glory. What? <laughs> See, if you'd be more focused on God's glory rather than your story, you'd find yourself getting through a whole lot of pain, a whole lot of trials. I'm telling you what, you have to face the suffering because if you don't walk through the suffering, you'll never learn the art of perseverance. And if you don't get perseverance in you, you'll never be a person of character. Come on, Voo Church. Give God some praise. Because I'm justified, I now have daily confidence. Give him five seconds. Come on, give him five seconds. Let faith rise up in this room. You're not quitting tonight. You have been justified. You're, you're in right standing with God. You have a daily confidence. Daily confidence. I don't wonder if God's mad at me. How could he be mad at me? Could he be mad at Jesus? He don't even see rich. He sees Jesus. I'm in Christ. Like if this was ever about my efforts, then I, I'm doomed a long time ago. Somebody in this place, you're like, I just don't think I deserve a second chance from God. Uh, you'd, be, you'd be smart to remember that you never deserved the first chance. Oh, yeah. I, I, okay, I get it. <laughs> this, this isn't about deserving. This, this, this is the power of what I'm trying to get at because some of you are still living as a follower of Jesus with so much guilt and condemnation. And you don't have to live that. You don't have to live in hiding. You could know that you've been justified. Right. Paul continues. I, I want to read like six verses. This is powerful. Romans chapter 5, verse 5 through 11. And hope. This is just, here comes gospel. Like, cool. This is just, goo, 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 goo. this is like, the four and a half minutes will not, you can't. It's just, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, I love this, at just the right time. Someone say, just the right time. Just the right time. What was the right time? When we were still powerless. Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, 
though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified in right standing by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The fifth blessing that we see is that we now experience the love of God. We experience the love of God. He died for you when you were his enemy. While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Not when I was like at the altar and then Jesus was like, okay, I'll die for him now. That's not how it worked. When I was a long way off, Jesus died for me. This past uh, Wednesday, I was, in, I was in Texas getting to preach to 200 pastors' kids. <laughs> These kids were awesome. Easiest room I've ever preached to my entire life. <laughs> These kids are 12 years old just clapping. I'm like, your dad taught you well. <laughs> But, but on Wednesday, I was at this, this campground, and I woke up like, I don't know what was, I had, I had the stomach flu. And phew, I, I phew. <laughs> like, I don't do sick. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> like, like I don't, and I don't do sick well. Like, I'm very dramatic. And so if I'm sick, everyone's going to know about it. I'm like, ah, you know, I'm moaning and groaning. It was an awful day. I was in my bedroom literally 14 hours, 6 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. This thing would not leave me. I'm like, God, why have you forsaken me, you know? <laughs> and I remember, though, because I had this sort of an epiphany moment while this was going on. I looked at Don Tree, very, very dramatic. I go, Don Tree, the only thing is we can't let Wyatt get this. I'll take it for three more days. <laughs> Just don't let Wyatt get sick. Get him out of the room. You know, we, we, we got him out of the room. I was like, I just don't want my boy to have to experience what it is that I'm experiencing. Now, I'm not boasting in that. That's just called being a good dad. But I can honestly say that as a father today, I would gladly and willfully give my life. I would lay my life down right now for Wyatt. Like, it's not like, once again, it's not like, oh, you're so amazing. No one, would, everyone's like, yeah, you should, bro. Like, everyone's like, yeah, okay, do you want claps here? We don't know, you know? We're not the pastor's kids. We get it. All right, so. <laughs> like, we all, we, like, that's, that's just called being a good dad. Yeah. Yet, I, I don't know, like, try to journey with me. Like, I don't know if, like, a known criminal who, who was on death row, if he called me, he's like, hey, Rich, uh, listen, I know you're a grace guy and all. Uh, I was wondering if we could swap spots. Like, I just, I don't know. I don't, I don't. Yet that's exactly what Jesus did. He, he didn't exchange his life for, like, all of his friends or for good people. He exchanged his life for sons of Adam who were born into sin. All right, let's go further. May, maybe, maybe. I would, I would lay my life down. There's, there's other people I would, yeah, I would lay my life down, for sure. L other people, for sure, for sure. M maybe I want to believe I would lay my life down for people I don't even know. I've never been put in that situation. But I know this. I would never lay Wyatt's life down for anybody. Yeah. Yet that's exactly what God did. Yeah. That God sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave his son. This is what we call the scandalous, reckless love of our God. It's the one-way love of God that he didn't love you because you deserved it. He loved you because that's who he is. Oh, I love how the scripture says that just the right time. What was the right time? When we were powerless. On my worst day, he was still at his best. 
on my worst day when I was an enemy of God. That's when God laid his life down for me. Why do you think that was the right time? I'll tell you why it's the right time. It was the right time because now all of us know that not one iota, not one bit of effort, not one deed contributed to our justification. But rather it was by God, for God, and all about God. He did all the work. I simply trust in his finished work. That's why we are, we're silly when we judge one another. Because every time we judge one another, what we're, what we're behaving like is that I did something more than you. No, you didn't. Oh, you discovered that you needed Jesus? That should live to a life of gratitude, not a life of judgment. Here's what's wild to consider. When Adam and Eve were banished from the garden, it wasn't just the consequence of death that they would suffer from sin, but what else? They lost a lot of things. What did they lose? They lost peace. They lost access to God. They lost hope. They lost a daily confidence, and they definitely lost the ability to experience the love of God. But this is what we get when we put our trust into Jesus, because when we put our trust into Jesus, he imputes, he gives his righteousness over to us, and now we've been justified, therefore we're in right standing. Now because I'm in right standing with God, I've got peace, I've got access to him, I've got hope, I've got confidence, and I can experience his great grand love every single day. You say, but Rich, that all just sounds... Way too good to be true. And Rich, that sounds far too easy. It does sound pretty easy, and it does sound too good to be true, but that's why it's called grace. Well, Rich, how did it happen? Explain it to me. Well, Paul, as he finishes the first 11 verses, he now pivots, and he goes verse 12 through 21. You're going to read it this week. In verses 12 through 21, he begins to do something he begins to reference the Garden of Eden. And ultimately what he's going to say is the same way that you became a sinner, much like that is the same way that you become righteous. I picked out one verse that I liked, Romans 5 verse 19. I think it sums up the section in an amazing way. You're gonna read it this week, but look at this. Romans chapter 5 verse 19. We're gonna do some Bible study. Here we go. For just as through the disobedience of the one man. Who's the one man that he's talking about? Come on, we can do better. Who's the one man he's talking about? Adam. Just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man. What, who's he talking about? What's the one man here? Jesus. What's the one man here? Jesus. Through the obedience of Jesus, the many will be made righteous. This is important. Because what Paul is going to begin to contrast right now, what Paul is going to begin to expose, and what Paul is going to begin to teach you and I, is that ultimately when God looks down upon humanity, he doesn't see Billy, and he doesn't see Bob, and he doesn't see Jennifer. Instead, he sees two men. He either sees Adam, or he sees Christ. And which one are you in? If you're in Adam, you're lost. But if you're in Christ, you're saved. And if you're saved, there's no more reason to walk around in guilt and shame and condemnation. You watch, Paul will say the word one 11 times. 11 times he'll say one man. Because he wants you to realize that it's not by your effort and it's not by your deeds, but rather it's by Jesus' sacrifice. He said, but Richard, it doesn't make any sense. Once again, I did not pay the sacrifice. Once again, I know you said he imputed his righteousness unto me, but what makes Jesus so righteous? What makes Jesus so different? How come somebody else didn't die for me? Well, I'm glad you asked. What makes Jesus different from anybody else is that Jesus, unlike you and I, was not a son of Adam. All right, let's go Christmas in July. You ready? Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary. You ever wonder, why, why is it such a big deal? Why do these Christians make such a big deal that she's a virgin? It's, 
because Jesus did not come from the seed of Joseph. So therefore, he does not carry the DNA of Adam or anyone else that went before him, but rather it's called the Immaculate Conception that the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary. And because of it, when Jesus was born, he wasn't born broken. He wasn't born busted. He wasn't born sick. He was born righteous and whole. Qualifying him as the only perfect atoning sacrifice. Qualifying him as the only thing that could not just cover sin, but he could cancel sin, past, present, and future. And Jesus, like Adam, he had his temptation test in a garden as well. But it was not the Garden of Eden. It wasn't paradise and it wasn't utopia. No, sin had already entered the equation and the world as we know it today is broken. For Jesus' temptation test came in the Garden of Gethsemane. And from Eden to Gethsemane, God was telling his story. And in Gethsemane, Jesus in a garden prayed and he was in anguish. In fact, we see the humanity of Jesus, don't we? Because Jesus, he actually prays this prayer. Father, if it's at all possible, let this cup pass from me. It shows us that in Gethsemane, when Jesus was posed with his option, much more difficult than just not eating fruit, but when he was posed with his option, whether or not he would obey, even for Jesus, obedience was a struggle. Anybody who tells you that obeying God is easy uh, wasn't Jesus. Because real godly obedience, it, it's a struggle and it's a fight. But I'm thankful for Jesus because there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, Father, not my will, but your will. And he was led to a cruel cross where they stretched him wide and they hung him high and his blood was shed. And when his blood was shed once and for all, all sin, past, present, and future, it was canceled under the blood of Jesus. Come on, we can thank him for it. Now, if we're being honest tonight, the whole Bible really is the story of two gardens, Eden and Gethsemane. That's the Bible. That's the story. You see, in Eden, Adam took a fall, but in Gethsemane, Jesus took a stand. In, in Eden, God, he sought Adam, but in Gethsemane, Jesus, he he sought God. In Eden, the devil led Adam to a tree that resulted in all of our death. But in Gethsemane, Jesus went to a tree that resulted in all of our life. Come on, somebody. And tonight, you got to make a decision. If you're here tonight and you're struggling with guilt and you call yourself a Christian, it simply comes down to you knowing the truth. For when we know the truth, the truth will set us free. You don't have to live in hiding. You don't have to live in shame. You simply have to make a decision. Are you going to live in Adam? Or are you going to live in the last Adam? His name is Jesus Christ. Do you have more trust in Adam's sin? Or do you have more trust in Jesus' salvation? Because I know they look similar. But baby, you better know, from Eden to Gethsemane, some things change. Oh, come on. The first Adam... Well, baby, he was formed from the ground, but the last Adam, he came from heaven. The first Adam, they called him the king of creation, but the last Adam, they called him king and priest of the new creation. The first Adam brought a curse, but the last Adam brought a blessing. The first Adam, he brought pain, but the last Adam, he brought purpose. The first Adam brought guilt, but the last Adam, he brought grace. The first Adam brought death. 